So please welcome Ben Ark to the stage for his talk, Commons, Capital and the Invisible Hand, the spirit of freedom in Bitcoin and Nostra. Please welcome Ben to the stage. Hello, everybody. Um, so those of you who don't know me, um, I work in Bitcoin and Nostra, and I develop software and hardware. I started out by making some simple little DIY free and open source hardware projects, points of sale, ATMs, those sorts of things. And then from that project grew the Allen Bits project, which is um, uh, now grown into a flourishing ecosystem of lots of developers all contributing all these different extensions uh, and has all this great functionality. Um, from LM Bits, there was an extension we made, we were called Diagon Alley, and it was a, an idea for decentralized marketplaces, sensory resistant marketplaces, used as public key crypto, um, and then also had like that resilient infrastructure so it would be hard to take down, and that's how we achieved sensory resistance. Well, me and Fearjaf worked on that together, and the ideas which went into Diagon Alley went on to become uh, Nostra. So I was very heavily interested in Nostra early on made the first Nostra Twitter client. Um, in fact, did the first Nostra talk at a conference at HCCP here in Prague. So that was cool, about three years ago. Um, and, and like all of us, I, over the 10 years of me working in Bitcoin and Nostra now, it's like, why, why am I working on this thing? Why does this thing have potential to make people more free? Like, what's, what's, why are we working in it? And then more too often, we get these billionaires who define Bitcoin to us and tell us what Bitcoin is. Um, so I've got these 20 minutes now, and it's usually when I do a talk, I do a workshop, or I'm, I'm talking about some new software or hardware we're working on. But really, I'm just going to use these 20 minutes to talk about the things I'm interested in in Bitcoin, whether we can define what Bitcoin is, whether there's an inherent danger in defining what Bitcoin is, um, and uh, yeah, the, the relationship between a commons, capital, um, and uh, how, what is the spirit of freedom which we're all aware of, which exists in Bitcoin and Nostra. Um, of course, you know, Bitcoin is going to uh, have an impact on private banking, and Nostra is going to have an impact on these big corporations which control social media, and a bunch of us think also things like marketplaces. So there's, a, there's definitely a, a, a change which will happen. So what would that change, or what could that change potentially look like? So the thing which really got me into Bitcoin originally was that concept of it being a digital commons. And a digital, so a, what is a commons? A commons is just a free space which anyone can access, and it has resources, and you can make use of, the, use of those resources. Um, there's a, a relationship which happens between the users of a commons where they have to have a sustainable relationship with those commons, or else over time it will become degraded. And in fact, it's, it, there's a, um, an incentive for the users and the people accessing that commons uh, to, um, to help that commons flourish, because then they can flourish as well. But of course, you have the tragedy of the commons. So over time, commons can be co-opted by private interest, and then someone can try and take control of the commons uh, for their own gain. Um, and this was nowhere more prevalent in... Uh, so the commons has existed since the beginning of time, of course. We were able to hunt in the forest and gather firewood and do all the things we want to do. Um, but uh, up to the medie medieval period in Europe, and in particularly in the UK, the, the commons was basically owned by the king. So you had the, the lords which had private property, you had the king who had private property, um, and uh, everything else was just owned by the king, which meant that if there, a normal person was to go hunting in the forest, or collect firewood, then they would be poaching or stealing, and then they could be killed, they could be put to death. Um, and they often were. So uh, this happened you know, up until really King John in the UK. Um, and in 1215, he, he pillaged the UK so badly that um, his lords were worried there was going to be a popular, an uprising from the, 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 the common folk. Uh, so they forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. Um, and in the Magna Carta, we first get that acknowledgement, uh, this is the Charter of Freedoms, as it is, as it's called. Uh, we get the acknowledgement of private property and people's, normal people's right to private property. In the Magna Carta, there was also the Charter of the Forest. The Charter of the Forest was the right for normal people to have access to the commons so they could hunt without being in fear of being accused of poaching and then being put to death. Uh, interestingly, 
the Robin Hood uh, mythology came from this time um, because uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Robin Hood and his band of merry men in the forest, living off the forest, antagonizing state, stealing from the rich to give to the poor, but it was a reflection of the Charter of the Commons and also Magna Carta. Um, and actually, so the, the relationship between states and private property, that acknowledgement that normal people could have private property was a huge thing. And then over the, the years, um, it started to impact the way they would engage with people. So a nice example, uh, again from the UK, is originally we had uh, the hearth tax. So you would be taxed on how many fires you had in your house. The idea being that rich people have more fires. But after Magna Carta, every Englishman's house was his castle. So that began to be seen as improper, which was a huge you know, uh, change in mentality. Um, so the tax man decided, OK, well, they said, well, it's probably best if we just count their windows. So they would count windows, and then your, your tax would be calculated on how many windows you had. Uh, so of course, people decided to brick up their windows so they didn't have to pay tax. Um, and then this happened in the, uh, the slum landlords in the cities um, for their factory workers. They would then, and in the, in the, in the, uh, as landlords, they would brick up all the windows. And you had all these people working in the cities and the factories, and they would have to go home to this dark squalor, which, of course, you ended up with disease and pestilence. And uh, this is where the, the term daylight robbery actually comes from, from this period. So we have the Industrial Revolution, and then people leave the countryside, and they move into wage labor and into the factories um, of the big cities. And uh, over at that period, we have a lot of these commons then being pri becoming to be privately owned because the people had moved out of the countryside. And this wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing because the British industrialists were able to get more yield out of those commons, but there wasn't that sustainable relationship which had existed before um, when people were accessing the commons. And it's also interesting at this period, um, work was, began to be defined specifically as wage labor. Uh, work historically was work. You know, if you were gathering firewood in the forest, or if you were hunting, or if you were attending to your livestock which are grazing in the commons, that was work. But then work became wage labor, and we all think of work now as the thing you do to get money, um, which you have to do. Uh, so yeah, so we have the Industrial Revolution, and uh, this wasn't seen as a bad thing, because British industrials could get more yield out of the commons. Um, and uh, in fact, so we had... Um, Oh, there's, there's something called the vagrancy laws. So they were so keen on getting workers into the factories that they created this thing called the vagrancy laws. And if you were caught without a job, uh, in the first incident in, um, when you were caught for the first time, you would be branded with a hot iron. And then the second time, they would just kill you, they would hang you. Uh, so they really wanted to get people into work. This is quite interesting. Um, so along came Adam Smith. And Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations. And he said that these British industrialists actually they have a vested interest in improving the lives of everyone in Britain, because they live in Britain, and this is where they operate from. And even if you've got like a sociopathic industrialist, they want to feel more secure. Um, and actually, it benefits them if everyone's a little bit richer around them, because they can buy their goods and services. Uh, so there was a vested interest, and he called this vested interest the invisible hand. That's become, over the years, generalized into this kind of mystical force where you just get equilibrium in a free market regardless of what type of capital exists. But in the context of Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith specifically said it was you know, because there was this drive to improve the environment in which the British industrialists lived. And uh, Adam Smith was aware of greed and the impact of greed. Um, and, you know, the, so the, the, his quote, all for, all for ourselves and nothing for other people, is the vile maxim uh, of the masters of mankind. And he was aware of the control which they will try and take over things like the commons. And here's the actual quote from Wealth of Nations. So in the invisible hand, although we, we do credit Adam Smith for coming up with it, uh, was mentioned once in Wealth of Nations, and Wealth of Nations is a very big book. And it was in the context, like I said, that there is a drive to improve the environment around uh, the British industrialists. And I think he was right. I think this is correct. Um, but what we start to see, 
Oh, no, wait, no. I think this is right. This was correct. And in fact, this started to be reflected by some of the British industrialists. So uh, Robert Owen, who was a mill owner in Wales, where I'm from, he came up with the first nursery schools. And the idea was if you could put the kids in a nursery school, then the parents could work without being worried about the kids. Um, and then they also, he also reduced the working hours because he could get more effective labor if people were working for less time. Um, so, yeah, this all came up to the uh, impeachment of Warren Hayes. So, we have this form of capital with these British industrialists where they do have a vested interest in where they live, but at that same time, shortly after Wealth of Nations in 1788, Warren Hastings from the East India Company was impeached. Um, and there's the, uh, for the, the way in which the East India Company had behaved in India. So, India at that time, before the East India Company, 200 years earlier, it had 40% of the world's GDP. It was a very rich place because uh, of the silk trade. And the UK had 0.4% of the world's GDP. Uh, but the East India Company went in there, completely ravaged it, got those resources back to Britain, and we started to build that British empire, which everyone hated. Um, and, uh, wait there. Yeah, so, um, but we, what, what, what happened at that point in, in history, which we need to recognize is this new form of capital began to exist. The corporation, the multinational corporation. Um, and uh, there's this great quote from the impeachment of Warren Hastings that w from the court, which was that a corporation has neither a soul to be condemned or a body to be punished. Uh, which I, I think is kind of true. Like it's a different form of capital to that British industrialist, a kind of soulless capital, a multinational capital where they're not held to account in the same way that um, smaller, medium-sized enterprises uh, under that Dunbar number probably are held to account. Internally, in something like an SME, like there's a relationship between the person who owns the capital and the workers who work in the in the business. And they want to, you know, they, they have that human bond and that human relationship with them. But a corporation tries to try attack that and tries to dissolve it. Um, so, you know, if you think about the current corporations we have, we have the shareholders, the executives, the managers, the workers. There's really no relationship between the shareholders and the workers. So corporations bypass that classical um, interpretation of the invisible hand which Adam Smith gave us. You no longer have that invisible hand. You're detached from you know, the, the people who you're impacting, both within the company and then also outside of the company as well. Um, and then we see, so the, I think why I'm talking about all this stuff is the, I'm trying to cover kind of the evolution of capital and its relationship with commons. Um, and actually, as Bitcoin, as a digital commons, there was a period where people, it was, people were trying to co-opt it. Uh, if you remember, like, the, the New York Agreement and the no to x movement, uh, the users said, no, we want this thing to be free access. We don't want this thing to be controlled by these big private interests um, and by a few people. In order for this thing to work and in order for this ecosystem to flourish, um, we need it to have free access, and we all need to nurture Bitcoin as a, a free, open source, digital commons we can all access. Um, so a, a student, so now I'm going to track like knowing whether we can know what Bitcoin is. And also that concept, the original Adam Smith concept of the invisible hand. Now, I don't think this link has been made before, um, but I think it's an important link. Adam Smith, um, so Wilhelm Hegel, was a student of Adam Smith, and he wrote Phenomenology of Spirit uh, in 1807. And in Phenomenology of Spirit, or Geist as he called it, um, he talks about, it was, well, the, the, it was a, a reaction to the prevailing Kantian philosophy of the time that we can't know something, we can't know what something is. Like, can I actually know what this piece of paper is? I have these limited senses as a human being, can I know what a thing is? And then Hegel said, well, no, we can, because we, you know, we all work together, and we, we have these conversations, and we have these discussions, and then we, we reach conclusions, and uh, we have like, our own spirit, our own geist, but then all our peers, we come to a consensus as to what the piece of paper is. You know, it's not a hat, or it's not a weapon, it's something else. So we can know the thing in itself. Um, oh, yeah, there we are. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah, Kant. So in Phenomenology of Spirit, the other thing which uh, Hegel spoke about was this concept of a dialectic. So since um, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the, the, the idea is how do you achieve true knowledge? How do you know something and know what something is? Philosophically, how do you know it and whether you can know it? Um, and they said, well, it was discussion and then you know, evidence and then you would come to conclusions and then you could talk about that thing as well. Um, and this was the dialogues of Plato and Socrates. 
and Aristotle's dialectic was taught, you know, up until, well, as, as one of the core parts of the liberal arts of how to attain true knowledge. Hegel took that and he abstracted it and said, okay, it doesn't just have to be a conversation between humans, it can be, so essentially you have a thesis, you have an antithesis, they conflict, and then you create synthesis. And the synthesis will probably be uh, a, a merging of the thesis and antithesis. Um, the, the, th the synthesis could, in fact, just be the thesis or the antithesis, maybe they were correct, but the reality is more often than not, it gets merged into one concept. That synthesis then becomes a new thesis, and then there's an antithesis to that thesis, and then you get synthesis again. And then it just repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats, and we start to understand more about this piece of paper. Um, so if you look at our understanding of the piece of paper over a thousand years, I would say we know more about this piece of paper and can define what it is more succinctly than we could a thousand years ago, and we will be able to do the same thing in a thousand years uh, more time. But the point is, the dialectic is a journey into knowing, into getting true knowledge, into getting truer knowledge. Um, so, oh yeah, the important part of the synthesis, oh sorry, important part of the dialectic, uh, Hegel's dialectic, is he said, you can, of course, th synthesize into something which is incorrect. Um, and you can, so it's a bit like, you know, we've got a room full of Bitcoiners, it's a bit like we've got our blockchain of, of, of true not, and we're going towards true knowledge, and then we get some orphan blocks coming off. Um, and we can find ourselves going down, you know, the wrong path. And the, so the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, often throughout history has been wrong. Uh, the common sense of an era can, can be wrong. You know, women were seen as property. Certain races in like Hegel's and Adam Smith's time were seen as inferior and it was fine to use them as slaves. Um, so yeah, so, the, so to know that although you can track where you came to your conclusion from, to say to yourself, well, this might not be true knowledge, or this might not be more true than what came before, is an important part of the Hegelian dialectic. Um, so it's that question, oh, it's that question we should ask ourselves, like, are we the baddies? You know, like, you can, where you're positioned, you can look back and you can track how you got to this certain point, but then you can, ultimately, you could just be wrong. And so that's Socrates, so Socrates, in order to attain true knowledge, of course, he said, you know, the only thing worth knowing is we know nothing. And that's why, because you have to be willing to accept that you were wrong about something um, in order to, you know, improve and, and, and get more knowledge. Where's that's coming off? Um, and we see this in, uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, where people become reliant upon defining what Bitcoin is at a certain period in time, and then building things for Bitcoin in that certain period of time, and trying to ossify the definition of Bitcoin, which to me feels risky, because when you define something and then say this is Bitcoin, yeah, then um, you're, you're limiting its scope, you're limit, limiting its ability to grow, just as when we at one time defined certain people as inferior and they could be a slave, which they had to kind of break out of. So there is an inherent risk in, um, in defining things. So uh, what I love is seeing Bitcoiners lead the charge on developing the Nostra protocol. So going back to that concept of digital commons, I think Bitcoiners are incredibly astute when it comes to keeping a digital commons free and give, give having it, people have free access to it. Because uh, with Bitcoin, of course, there's a monetary incentive to try and take over the commons and try and take control of it. Um, and I think that the, the, the Adam, uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand and that, that's that idea of Geist was in fact correct and that we as Bitcoiners, or we are working in Nostra, we have our own things we're building, we have our own autonomy, self-interest, and spirit, but there is kind of a spirit of Bitcoin, an invisible hand, which will give you a bitch slap if you try and uh, act inappropriately. And there we are, there's the bit slash, bit, bit, uh, the, the bitch slap. Um, so this is the idea of when someone says, one of the next billionaire comes along and says Bitcoin is X. I tend to find that within the developer community, of people building stuff, and making use of those commons and that fertile ground, that happens less. Um, it's more these kind of thought leader types uh, because I think they know that you know, these are tools which evolve over time. They're more aware that this is a, a working progress project and we're not in the dialectic of Bitcoin's uh, journey, we're not quite at the end of history. So yes, we can say a bunch of things about Bitcoin now, which we think it is, but we're still on that path to attaining true knowledge and ultimately we might be wrong, we might be the baddies in some regard. Um, so yeah, so the link between Adam Smith's invisible hand, 
the, the idea of Geist from Hegel's work philosophically, um, I think are very important to, to sort of, con not defining what Bitcoin is, but conceptualizing the, um, the, 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 the work we're doing to try and make something better, and also just the general progress uh, for humanity. So Hegel said that, you know, what's the overriding incentive for everybody? And it's freedom, we all want more freedom. So over time for humanity, that power is, uh, is, is, is so powerful that the, through that dialectical process, we will all eventually end up with more freedom and liberty. And you know, if you zoom out far enough, that's essentially what we see in history. So there's reasons to be hopeful. Anyway, thank you very much.